Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. Good morning, I'm Nathan Hager. And I'm Karen Moscow. Here are the stories we're following today. Karen, we begin in Normandy, France. That is where President Biden is gathering with world leaders to mark 80 years since the Allied invasion that turned the tide in World War II on D-Day. The president will meet with Ukraine's president, Volodymyr Zelensky, and look to tie his country's current conflict with Russia to the West's fight against the Nazis. Former NATO Ambassador Kay Bailey Hutchison says the world needs to stand united against Vladimir Putin. It is so important that, and I'm sure that President Biden will will say, the importance of us being allied against Russia, trying to take over a free country, uh, is something we must stand against. Because if we don't, then we will be involved in a war in Europe, and that's what we're all trying to avoid. Former NATO Ambassador Kay Bailey Hutchison was a guest on Bloomberg's Balance of Power. President Biden gave a preview of what he'll say in Normandy at a fundraiser this week. He told donors, quote, democracy is literally on the ballot this year. Well, Nathan, back here in the U.S., New Yorkers who dreaded the $15 congestion pricing fee are cheering the governor's decision to halt the program. Bloomberg's Jeff Bellinger has the latest from Manhattan. Some questions remain about how to replace the $1 billion expected pot to repair public transportation, improve air quality, and reduce congestion. But Brooklynites, Manhattanites, and especially Staten Islanders are ecstatic. It had become a major issue in the upcoming congressional races, and Governor Kathy Hochul focused on that in her message. My focus must be on putting more money back in people's pockets. And that's why I must stand up for them. The measure is on the shelf indefinitely. In New York, Jeff Bellinger, Bloomberg Radio. All right, Jeff, thank you. Turning to markets, interest rates are in focus overseas as the European Central Bank gets ready to make a policy decision. Bloomberg's Lizzie Burden is covering from Frankfurt. Well, we've seen Christine Lagarde entering the Central Bank this morning. She didn't want to cut before Federal Reserve, but it looks like she will. This quarter point cut to 3.75%, well telegraphed, fully priced by markets, and almost unanimously expected by economists. And of course, we'll listen to Lagarde at the press conference for guidance on the cadence of cuts. Can we expect them quarterly? Is it a case that they cut today and pause and go back to data dependence? Bloomberg's Lizzie Burden notes the ECB has held its rate at a record high 4% for nine months. Well, Nathan, as we await the ECB decision, global bonds are on their longest winning streak of the year, while stocks in the U.S. are trading at all-time highs. We get the latest with Bloomberg's John Tucker. John. And Karen, there is now a worldwide consensus that interest rates will be cut this year. As a result, sovereign bond returns rose for a fifth straight session. Another day of gains would mark the best run since November. Investors trying to capture those bond yields before the central banks start cutting. Well, just yesterday, the Bank of Canada decided to ease, as softer than expected U.S. economic data suggests the Fed may cut rates two times before year-end. And the winning streak extends beyond bonds. The S&P 500 hit its 25th record this year. The Nasdaq 100 climbed 2%. And if history's any guide, more stock gains may be on the way. Since 1928, the first 15 days of July have been the best two-week trading period for the year for equities. John Tucker, Bloomberg Radio. All right, John, thanks. Helping to lead this current stock rally is NVIDIA. That company's market value has now topped $3 trillion. Steve Sosnick is chief strategist at Interactive Brokers. As early as like February 23, I did a count at how many times they used the word AI in their conference call. It was like 82 times or something. But they leaned into it early. Once this AI became the, the investment theme, NVIDIA became the stock to watch. But at, and at this point right now, my thesis is it's NVIDIA's market. We're all just trading in it. Interactive broker Steve Sosnick notes shares in the AI chip giant have gained some 140 percent this year, making NVIDIA now more valuable than Apple. Well, Nathan, another member of the $3 trillion club is also in the spotlight. The Wall Street Journal is reporting U.S. regulators are investigating whether a deal Microsoft struck with AI startup Inflection may have been structured to avoid scrutiny. Back in March, Microsoft agreed to pay Inflection $650 million to license its AI software after the company moved to hire much of its staff. The journal says the Federal Trade Commission is now seeking information about how they negotiate 
initiated that partnership. And Karen, the tech uh, investigations might not end there. The New York Times is reporting that the U.S. has cleared the way for antitrust inquiries into Microsoft, as well as NVIDIA and OpenAI. The paper says the Justice Department and the FTC have agreed to divide responsibility for investigating the three major players in the AI industry. Well, Nathan, another big company is facing scrutiny in Washington. Boeing CEO Dave Calhoun will face a bipartisan inquiry into the plane maker's safety practices and culture. He'll appear before the Senate Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations on June 18th. The panel began examining the plane maker earlier this year after whistleblowers flagged concerns with the company's manufacturing practices. Well, Karen, Boeing did take a big step forward yesterday, a big step up, actually, with the successful launch of its Starliner space taxi. This morning, it is SpaceX's turn. Elon Musk's space company is set for the fourth major test flight of its massive Starship rocket and super heavy booster from the southern tip of Texas. Liftoff is set for 8 a.m. Wall Street time. The launch window runs till 10, though, and we will bring you live coverage on Bloomberg Radio. It's time now for a look at some of the other stories making news in New York and around the world. For that, we're joined by Bloomberg's Michael Barr. Michael, good morning. Good morning, Karen. Gilgo Beach murder suspect Rex Hurman will be indicted on new charges today. Suffolk County District Attorney Ray Tierney is announcing what he is calling a very significant development. All expectations are that Hurman will be linked to at least one and possibly two victims, some of the cases dating back decades. Senate Democratic leaders say they plan more votes after a bill to protect contraceptive access failed yesterday. Some Republicans argued the legislation was too broad and isn't necessary and accused Democrats of fear-mongering and trying to score political points. Republican Senator Ted Cruz. Democrats in the Senate, every one of them, their views on abortion are extreme and radical. Every Democrat in this body has voted repeatedly in favor of unlimited abortion on demand, literally up until the moment of birth. Democrats argued women should have the right to birth control and believe the overturning of Roe versus Wade could jeopardize other reproductive rights. An appeals court has halted the Georgia election interference case against former President Donald Trump and others while it reviews the lower court judge's ruling, allowing Fulton County District Attorney Fonnie Willis to remain on the case. The Georgia Court of Appeals yesterday issued the order which will prevent Fulton County Superior Court Judge Scott McAfee from moving forward with pre-trial motions while the appeal is pending. This makes it even more certain that the case is unlikely to go to trial before the November general election. Former federal prosecutor Lori Levinson is a professor at Loyola Law. I don't think that there's anything that the prosecutors can do in Georgia at this point. This is not an issue that they can raise to a higher court. They're going to have to wait and see if under the Georgia Court of Appeal order, Bonnie Willis, the district attorney who brought these charges, can even stay on this case. Meanwhile, in another court victory for the former president, Florida federal judge Eileen Cannon postponed the schedule in Trump's Mar-a-Lago classified documents case. It reshuffles the timing for hearings on several important legal issues. The criminal trial of President Biden's son, Hunter, resumes this morning in Delaware. The prosecution could arrest its case today. Hunter Biden is charged with lying about his drug use when he purchased a gun in 2018. Global News, 24 hours a day and whenever you want it with Bloomberg News Now. I'm Michael Barr, and this is Bloomberg. Karen. All right, Michael Barr, thank you. Time now for the Bloomberg Sports Update with John Stashauer. John, good morning. All right, good morning, Karen. Another win for the Yankees. This one was easy at the stadium. A four-run first inning against the Twins, and they tacked on in the fifth, loading the bases. Castillo's pitch to Judge. He's lined. Face hit into left. That one's going all the way into the corner. One run scores. Two runs score. Here comes Soto around third. Having all kinds of trouble with the ball in left field. And to third goes Aaron Judge. And the Yankees have blown this one wide open. On WFAN, five RBIs for Judge. Three hits for Anthony Volpe. Minnesota scored some runs late off the Yankee bullpen. But the Yanks won 9-5. to five. They've won seven in a row. 18 of 22. They're 5-0 and oh versus the Twins by a combined score of 28-7. to seven. They seek the sweep tonight. A three-game sweep for the Mets. 
Their first since mid-April, 9-1 round of Washington as Luis Torrens homered twice. The Yankees won 9-5. The Mets won 9-1. And the Red Sox won 9-0 over Atlanta. They out-hit the Braves 13-1. And the Giants won 9-3 at Arizona Grandstand for Wilmer Flores. The French Open, two upsets in the women's quarterfinals. First, Jasmine Paolini, the 5-foot-4-inch Italian surprise, fourth-seeded Elena Rabaka, and then 17-year-old Russian Mira Andreeva knocked off second-seeded Arena Sabalenka. She becomes the youngest semifinalist in Paris since Martina Hingis in 1997. The two winners beat today the marquee match Coco Goff against Iga Siontek. NBA Finals tipping off tonight in Boston. Celtics and Mavs well-rested. They won their conference finals in four and five games. Both have been off for more than a week. The college football playoff tripling in size, going from four teams to 12. The schedule now out. The playoff begins December 20th. Last for a month, quarterfinal games, New Year's weekend. The semifinals will be in Dallas and Miami. Championship game in Atlanta. John Stash Edward, Bloomberg Sports, Karen and Nathan. Coast to coast on Bloomberg Radio, nationwide on Sirius XM, and around the world on Bloomberg.com and the Bloomberg Business app. This is Bloomberg Daybreak. Good morning, I'm Nathan Hager. World leaders are gathering in Normandy, France to mark 80 years since the Allies stormed the beaches and turned the tide against the Nazis. It is a chance for those allies, including President Biden, to reaffirm their support today as Europe faces its biggest conflict since World War II in Russia's war with Ukraine. For more, we are joined by Bloomberg News Paris Bureau Chief Alan Katz, who is with us from our newsroom in the French capital. Alan, good morning. The historical sweep of this gathering 80 years after D-Day is certainly significant. Set the scene for us. What are we expecting from today's observances? Well, today is mostly going to be about uh, the ceremony, as you said. It's the 80th anniversary, so there are uh, several veterans, both the British, uh, American, Canadian, uh, and all the allies who did storm the beaches back in D-Day, and they're all around 100 years old now. So this is sort of the last time that they expect there to be such a big gathering of veterans left uh, from uh, from the, the D-Day uh, assault. And so you have right now, you have King Charles from the UK giving a speech at the moment. Uh, at around 12.30, uh, Joe Biden, President Biden, will give a speech uh, for the U.S. commemoration. And then this afternoon, there'll be a, an international commemoration bringing together all of the allies and even uh, some opponents from the time, including uh, German Chancellor Olaf Scholz. Uh, that will be around 3.30 this afternoon. Uh, and so there'll be this sort of a series of, again, mostly commemorative events. Uh, Joe Biden is uh, speaking with um, veterans this morning before a wreath-laying ceremony, before his speech. Uh, it, it will be largely ceremonial today, uh, with many of the speeches talking about how they need to come together how they need to how democracies need to unite in the face of authoritarianism again both said and but largely unsaid will be the connection between the fight back then and Ukraine's fight against Russia today and we should note uh, Paris is six hours ahead of the East Coast in the U.S. We're expecting that speech from President Biden around 6.30 a.m. Wall Street time. And we've gotten something of a preview, Alan, of what the president plans to say, as you alluded to, sort of tying the conflict from World War II uh, to what he sees as a fight to defend democracy today. It's a fight that uh, he hopes resonates with voters as he f uh, prepares for a rematch against former President Donald Trump. That's true. I mean, he's he's unlikely to bring up Trump directly in the speech, particularly in the one today. He's giving some other speeches uh, tomorrow, uh, which might be a little bit more explicitly political. But it, again, uh even just bringing up the idea that you need to unite, uh, work with your allies to stand up against uh, tyranny and authoritarianism are sort of veiled attempts to draw a difference or a distinction between him and um, former President Donald Trump. Uh, Trump was here for the 75th anniversary, so five years ago. At the time, he uh, publicly at least uh, supported American uh, veterans um, from D-Day, but really made no comment or, or didn't even mention sort of allies and and institutions that were created by the United States following World War II to try to sort of keep the peace um, after World War II. And so Biden's really going to try to show that he's a different kind of leader, uh, that he's the leader of the United States, but also the leader of a broader group of, of allies uh, that can come together in times of, of crisis. From the European perspective, Alan, how do leaders feel about the relationship with the U.S. right now, particularly given all the strife that we saw around uh, support for Ukraine militarily in Congress uh, just a couple of months ago? 
It varies from country to country, but France, for example, has been uh, quite worried about it, actually. And if you listen to uh, President Macron, French President Emmanuel Macron's speeches over the last month or two, he's painted quite a, a disturbing picture of worry about whether or not the U.S. will continue to be there. Um, and his argument has been that Europe needs to, you know, master its own defense and, uh, and and in order to be sort of the master of its future, has to create a, a common a defense program that could protect a country like Ukraine against uh, against Russian aggression. Um, he didn't call out Biden on the defense part of it because Biden has been much more supportive of NATO. But his basic point is that after Trump's presidency, you just can't be sure how the United States is going to proceed. Again, there there hasn't been much, I guess, explicitly on the delay in Congress on reauthorizing the aid to, to Ukraine, but it did help play into this idea that the U.S. has become, while it was sort of the ultimate security blanket for Europe for decades and decades following World War II, that things are changing and that Europe needs to be ready for it. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Today, your morning brief on the stories making news from Wall Street to Washington and beyond. Look for us on your podcast feed at 6 a.m. Eastern each morning on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. You can also listen live each morning starting at 5 a.m. Wall Street time on Bloomberg 1130 in New York, Bloomberg 991 in Washington, Bloomberg 1061 in Boston, and Bloomberg 960 in San Francisco. Our flagship New York station is also available on your Amazon Alexa devices. Just say Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Plus, listen coast to coast on the Bloomberg Business app, Sirius XM, the iHeartRadio app, and on Bloomberg.com. I'm Nathan Hager. And I'm Karen Moscow. Join us again tomorrow morning for all the news you need to start your day right here on Bloomberg Daybreak.